Book of Ruth. Uh, Book of Ruth is it's written after David has has become king. Uh, so it's written at some point after about 1011 BC, but it deals with events that occurred in the latter part of the days of the judges. As I've said a number of times, the judges begins shortly after the death of Joshua, which would be around 1366 BC, and it ends with the anointing of King Saul around 1051. So it's written sometime after David, maybe in the reign of David, maybe in the reign of Solomon, maybe in the reign of Josiah, which would be significantly later. Sometime after that, but it reports these events that take place during the latter part of the period of Judges. Now we, we read in chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, that famine came on the land of Israel, which prompted Elimelech and Ephrathite from Bethlehem and Judah, prompts him to relocate to Moab with his wife Naomi and their two sons, Malon and Kilion. Now one person last week understood me to say that Naomi was not an Israelite. Now I certainly didn't mean to say that since she is an Israelite, but you know how that goes. <laughs> Uh, you know, I never know what's coming out here. I am, I, I, I am prone to mixing up Ruth and Naomi. I do that sometimes when I'm talking, so I'm just hoping when I do that that the brain cramp will be obvious enough that you'll make the switch and say, oh, he didn't mean to say that. But, so I don't know if I said that last week or not. But uh, Now, Elimelech, as we've seen, Elimelech died, and then Naomi's two sons, they each took a Moabite wife, one named Orpah, the other named Ruth. And I spent perhaps more time than I should have explaining why I side with those scholars that believe it was not sinful. It was not sinful for Malon and Kilion to take Moabite wives, and thus it wasn't sinful for Naomi to permit them to do that. Now let me just real quickly recap that. I won't give you the whole deal here. But uh, I think that because there's no indication of repentance on Naomi's part, and yet God reverses her emptiness and blesses her. And that implies to me that there was no need for her to repent. And then secondly, the Mosaic Law it specifically prohibited marrying women from nations that Israel dispossessed during the conquest of the Promised Land. And Moab's not among those nations. Then there are some other things that you have to look at. In 1 Kings 11, Ezra 9, and Nehemiah 13. And I tried to explain how those texts can be understood consistently with that limitation that you're, you are not to marry foreigners from the land you dispossess. So I, I explained how I think those things fit together. Then thirdly, the ban in Deuteronomy 23 on Moabites entering the assembly of the Lord. That wasn't a ban on marrying Moabites. Then I also explained how that would not prevent Obed from being able to enter. Even though the Moabites were banned from entering the assembly even to ten generations, the son born to Ruth as a proselyte would be a full Israelite, and thus that wouldn't apply. And then finally, the author gives no hint of disapproval of Malon and Kilion and marrying the Moabites. No suggestion of that at all. So all of those things cause me to side with those scholars like Hubbard and a number of others who think that, no, you know, that wasn't something sinful. Now, I say that, I emphasize that because it colors my reading. What is the theological message of the book? As I said, it's easy to read Ruth simply as an entertaining story, but it's deeper than that, and there is a message here. It serves a function in Scripture of what is God doing. And so that colors how I read that, and that's why I've been beating that to death. Now, verse 4, the latter part of verse 4 It says they lived there about ten years, probably meaning that they lived there ten years after Malon and Kilion had married. And then Malon and Kilion, they die without having had any children, leaving Elimelech's line on the verge of extinction. Okay, and that's a, a tragedy in itself, but it also leaves the reader wondering about the hinted connection with David. Here we had this thing, uh, where we have from the, you know, the, the, uh, Ephrathites from the, from Bethlehem. And, and you say, well, wait a minute, here we have this link, this hinting at this connection with David, and now we have Elimelech's line on the verge of distinction, so the reader's thinking, well, how is he going to connect to David then? So it's partly as a literary drama, you get to see that, but also we see that with them die, with, with the, uh, Malon and Killian dying and leaving no children, it leaves Naomi in this dire state of having no provision and protection. And I've emphasized how bad that was, and it's hard for us to relate to that. 
because we just live in such a totally different society. Verses 6 and 7 of chapter 1, uh, Naomi, accompanied by Orpah and Ruth, she heads back to Bethlehem after having learned that the famine in Israel was over. That's verses 6 and 7. And then verses 8 through 10, Naomi, pr- presumably at some kind of point of no return, she urges Orpah and Ruth each to return to their mother's house. Naomi kisses them goodbye, and Orpah and Ruth, they say through their tears, they say, no, we'll return with you to, with you, to, you, to your people. And I want to pick back up. We were looking at 11 through 14. I want to pick back up there, say a little bit about that, and then we'll move on. 11 through 14, it says, But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for things are too bitter for me for you to share. For the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. I, I, I said a little bit about this last time. I want to repeat a little of that, and then we'll go on. She again insists that they turn back, and she asked this rhetorical question, why will you go with me? And the obvious answer to that is, look, it, it's, the point is, is that it's foolish for you to go with me, okay, for, for for you to come with me, things aren't going to turn out. It would be better off for you to return and go back to your homeland. And she makes clear through a rhetorical question that she's too old to have children. And you know about, you know, I mentioned Tamar before this idea. Listen, I'm too old to have kids. And even if I wasn't, if I had a child today, are you really going to wait long enough for that child to grow up to be of marrying age? So she's trying to encourage them. Listen, you need to go back. And she, you know, she says, you, you have to go back. It's time for you uh, to go back. And then in the, the, second, the last part of verse 13, the second part here, she emphatically, she says, no, my daughters. And the meaning of that, is, as expressed in the New English translation, is, no, my daughters, you must not return with me. And so she's telling them, you, you must not, you have to go back. And the reason they must not return with her is given in these first two clauses. In these two clauses, no, my daughters... You must not return with me is the meaning of that. Then it says, for, why shouldn't you return? Why must you not return with me? For, and then here's where I said this first clause is subject, it's difficult to translate. And it's it's subject to a number of different translations. And I'm following the translation by Frederick Bush, who is a Hebraist. And he says, no, for, things are too bitter for me for you to share. And then the second clause elaborates on that. For the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So she's saying to them, you you can't come with me because I'm getting hammered. I am an enemy of God for some reason. She has no idea. But He has turned against me. He's got me in His sights for some reason. And so you'd be crazy to go with me. Here's what Robert Hubbard Hubbard says in his commentary. He says, Thus Naomi made her most crucial point. If even God was after her, to follow her home was to court personal disaster. Her earlier tragedies, famine, exile, bereavement, childlessness, might be only the beginning. One ought to shun such a person to escape the maelstrom of her misfortune. What better argument to make return to Moab attractive? So this is, this is her state of mind when she's telling them that you have to return, you have to go back. Because she feels she is getting hammered and you can understand why. And I think it's important to appreciate how deeply Naomi's outlook for the future was darkened by her perception that God was afflicting her. That God had her in His crosshairs. That God, she was God's enemy and He was after her. I can understand how she'd feel that way. You think my husband dies, okay. My sons die. And she's going, what in the world? I'm here famine, I'm over here in a foreign land, husband dead, son dead, other son dead, no children. Yikes! See, what in the world is happening? And so you can understand this, at least I can. But it's important to appreciate how deeply, see, her outlook for the future is being affected by that perspective. I think it accounts for her initial lack of hope that her emptiness would be reversed. 
She doesn't hope for her emptiness to be reversed. She's telling them, you need to go back there because I'm a dead, I'm dead man walking. You need to go back there because God has turned against me. Her belief in God's willingness to bless her life, to demonstrate hesed toward her, to demonstrate you know, a loyalty and a commitment to bless her, her idea and her conviction of God's willingness to bless her life, it had been gutted by her pain. Have you ever been there in your life? Have you ever in your life experienced such tragedy and suffering and sorrow that you feel that God has turned against you and people tell you and encourage you and say these things and you're just so down? You can't shake the sense that God is pursuing me. Somehow He's after me. She still knows that He's God. She certainly knows that. But she feels that God has turned against her. But again, I don't see her charge that God was afflicting her. I don't see that as an expression of re rebellion. I don't see her as rebelling against God. Rather, I see it as an utterance of a wounded soul. You see, that has suffered grievously without understanding why. Why am I suffering like this? Why is this happening to me? It's not happening to this lady next door. She's got a house full of kids. They're all great. She's celebrating. Yet why is my husband dead, my son dead, my other son dead, and I have no children and I'm left with nothing? You see, she's suffering that way. And it's affecting her. And it's gutting her sense of God's commitment to her. And I think there's a huge message in here for us as we live and walk in this fallen world. She trusted God. You see, and you say, well, look, shouldn't she have, shouldn't she have trusted God's commitment to her welfare despite her suffering? Well, she should have. Yeah, but that's not always easy from the ash heap. That's not always easy when you're getting pounded. You know, you suffer one loss, you suffer another, you suffer another, and you begin to think, there's more going on here. Something is happening. God doesn't care about my welfare at all. In fact, He is trying to hurt me. They say, well, you shouldn't think that. Okay, I understand that. But do you know how suffering wears on you and how... And that's where she is. That's where he is. You think about Job, right? In the midst of terrible suffering. Job, Job is righteous. Righteous Job, he said that God multiplies his wounds without cause and fills him with bitterness. He says that in chapter 9, verses 17 to 18. Job was so low, he lamented the fact he'd ever been born. Why in the world did you even bring me into this world? This world is such a bust, such a bummer, so much suffering, so much crying. Why in the, I'd have rather never have been born than come into this thing and have, and be pounded like I'm getting pounded. You can see what it does to you. I mean, it really puts a person down there. Job asked God in Job 13, 24, why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? What do you mean God is your enemy? Well, that's how he felt. That's how he felt because he was suffering. He had lost. He had suffered greatly. And I see Naomi in that emotional ballpark. That's how I see Naomi. She is someone who has endured and suffered greatly. And she says, no prospect. And she says, with God as my enemy, God having targeted me, what in the world is going to come of anything? So she's urging them to go ahead and back. Now, in response to this appeal, they again, they wept loudly. And then Orpah kissed Naomi goodbye, and she turns back for home. Orpah turns back for home. And this signals this is the end of Naomi and Orpah's relationship. And Orpah's not mentioned again in the book. So she's telling him, you need to go back. That's the smart move. I'm targeted. You don't want to be collateral damage hanging around me because of the way God has been afflicting me. And so Orpah, she winds up t turning back. Now, her decision is neither condemned nor praised by the author. You don't get any indication that it's simply reported and it serves to highlight Ruth's contrary response. 
See, so you have this, she just goes back, no comment about that, but it heightens Ruth's response, which is introduced in verse 14 with this simple statement, but Ruth clung to her. So here we go, Orpah goes back, Ruth clings to her, and then we see in 15 to 18, it says, and she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more. More also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Now this is something really amazing. Naomi feels so hopeless about her future since she believes that God has in essence cursed her. She feels so hopeless about her future that she urges Ruth to follow Orpah's lead in turning back to Moab, even though she recognizes that it will involve a return to her pagan roots. Now, people seize on this. They say, Look, no faithful Jew would do that. Maybe no faithful Jew would do that, but not one who's getting pounded. I, just, I don't see the trouble in relating to this. The sorrow and the suffering that has come from these losses, leaving this woman destitute, leaving her with no connection. And that people are going to sit here and say, well, no faithful Jew would do that. Well, maybe not in ideal circumstances, but I can see a human being doing that. I can certainly see a human being doing that. And saying, listen, even though it means that odds are better there than with me, you need to go ahead and turn back. See, she feels so targeted by God that she apparently believes that her daughters-in-law, they'd be better off as pagans in Moab than as members of her family in Judah. Now, that's not true. Okay, that's not true. I understand that's not true as the story is going to, re- is, is going to reveal to us as it unfolds. But it seemed that way to Naomi because her perception of Yahweh was being distorted by her suffering. That's how it was. It was distorting her perception of God's commitment to her, to bless her. She didn't see that at all. She was suffering and all she saw was the hammer. And yet in the midst of her sense of divine hostility toward her, where she says, listen, God is my enemy. He's after me. He's targeted me. He has in essence cursed me. In the midst of that, God is already working to reverse her emptiness. In Ruth's demonstration of hesed. See, working to reverse her emptiness through the life of an average person who is willing to reflect God's character. Where is this starting? It is starting with Ruth saying, I'm with you. I'm committed to you. That is God's character that she is reflecting toward her. And what is she seeing? Pain and suffering and sorrow. And I shouldn't have been born. She doesn't say that. That's from Job. But this is the sense. The sense, already though, what's happening? God is working in the midst of her suffering to reverse it, and she's oblivious to it. Right? He's working through this demonstration, through this average person, ordinary person, who is willing to reflect God's character. He takes that person and begins to reverse Naomi's emptiness. Now, she doesn't see that. She just sees, here's this person. No, you don't want to come with me. She tries everything she can to discourage her from coming. But when she says these things and reflects that attitude of God, He then uses her to reverse this situation and circumstance. Ruth's immortal response, verses 16 and 17 to Naomi's final urging is, I mean, this is an amazing expression of loyalty and commitment to Naomi's welfare, isn't it? I mean, now this is something, this is love here. This is a commitment to somebody here where she says these things. She tells Naomi to stop telling her to turn back. Stop telling her to turn back. Naomi's effort notwithstanding, Ruth is going to stick with Naomi. She's going to identify with the Jews and she's going to serve Yahweh as her God. And she says that she'll die and be buried where Naomi dies. And then she takes an oath to be punished by Yahweh if anything but death separates her from Naomi. 
Now you talk about committing yourself to somebody. Now, why do you, do you see the nobility? Do you see the virtue in that kind of commitment to somebody? Okay, do you see that? It is a noble thing. It is God's character to, to give yourself to somebody like that. And I tell you, this has something to say about marriages. It's many times read in marriages and weddings. But do you see the virtue of this kind of commitment to somebody else? She says, listen, I'll take this oath before God. May He do this and worse to me, if anything but death separate. I'm, I'm holding to you like a mad dog. You see, I'm committed to you, and you can't scare me off, and nothing's going to scare me off, and I will pour out my life to bless you! Naomi, oh, yeah. I'll give my life for you. Well, what about all of her dreams and hopes? I'll give my life to bless you. We hate that. <laughs> right? They say, no, listen, it's about me. It's about me and all of the things that instead of about me serving and giving. And that's why this is, I think, why the story is gripping. And I see, I said, I have no problem with it being named the book of Ruth. Because you see, the linchpin of God's blessing of Naomi is this tremendous woman, Ruth, who says these things. You talk about committing to somebody. She does. Now, given Ruth's, Ruth's obvious determination, I mean, she's taken an oath. Naomi then relents, and presumably she now felt free from any responsibility uh, for Ruth's unknown faith in Jerusalem. See, because she's concerned about that. That's why she's telling him you have to go back. And she says, listen, I've gone above and beyond and now I'm telling you everything I know to tell you to get you back. All right, you come and you come. But now I don't have any responsibility for whatever befalls you for hooking your wagon to me, one that she thinks she sees herself as having been cursed by God. Hubbard, Robert Hubbard, he says of, uh, of Ruth, whatever her motives, deep affection, a sense of loyalty, misguided idealism, she sacrificed her destiny to cling to an aged, hopeless mother-in-law one may understand Orpah, one must emulate Ruth. You see, and I just want, I hope you see and see, Jews understood this expression of hesed from Ruth and how that was the character of God. They understood the virtue and nobility, and you'll see it later, right? When, when Boaz says, everybody knows about you. Everybody knows what you've done and how great it is. Okay, so this is, this is a... a very virtuous, powerful thing. Then in 19 to 21, it says, So the two of them went on their way. Uh, so the two of them went on, went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Now, this is what I want you to see. You saw it a little bit earlier, but I want you to see. I'm not dreaming up this aspect of her spirit. I'm not dreaming up that she feels, in essence, cursed by God. You see right here how she feels she expresses this, even though what is God doing? He's already, already working. He's already working to reverse her emptiness, but what if she, she's oblivious to it? All she can see is the pain and suffering that has come into her life for some reason she doesn't understand, and that's how it is a lot of times. You know, trying to chart, well, here's what God is doing. That's tough business, people. That's tough business. Now, sometimes you can have a decent idea. But I'm telling you from life, most of the time it's looking back on events that you gain a better perspective of what was God doing. Because when you're in it, you're just sitting there going, oh, oh. you see? And so already God is working here and she doesn't see that. Now, Naomi, they arrive in Bethlehem. This creates a buzz and the women are saying, is this Naomi? This might have just been merely an expression of surprise because she'd been gone so long. But it might indicate that her suffering had actually worn on her physically. Daniel Block says this in his commentary. He says, The years of grief and deprivation have surely taken their toll on Naomi's form and visage. 
The one who had left Bethlehem as Naomi, the pleasant one, a robust woman in her prime, had returned as a haggard and destitute old woman. Now, you, you know that that can, that can happen to you. Life can beat you so that it expresses itself physically. You, know, you wind up just uh, getting hammered and you, 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 it, it reflects itself in a person. Now, her state of mind is made clear in her response to those who are, who are asking the question. She tells them, look, don't call me Naomi. Look, don't call me Naomi because that name, which means pleasant or lovely, that no longer fits my circumstances. Don't call me that. Instead, they should call her Mara, which means bitter. Now, that'd be better for me, you see. You call me Mara. Don't call me Naomi, the lovely, good, pleasant. That no longer fits my circumstances. You call me bitter because God Almighty had afflicted her. Now, that fits my circumstances. Call me bitter. She'd left with a husband, two sons, hope of descendants. She returns with no husband, no sons, no grandchildren. So why call her pleasant when the Lord had singled her out for calamity? It says, when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity on me. Why are you going to call, why are you going to call me pleasant? What's pleasant about it? It's a nightmare. It's suffering, it's tears, it's sackcloth, it's ashes, it's a bummer. That's life. So that's her feeling, that's her heart, you see it. Now, who, what human being, you sit here and say, oh, how impious. You see, I'm telling you, that's somebody who hasn't suffered. All right, that's somebody who hasn't suffered. You suffer, you can say, all right, it ought to be this way. Ideally, should be this way. God would have it this way. But I get it. <laughs> you see, I get it. I understand what that can wind up doing to a person. Now, here we see the narrator's summary here in 22. He says, So Naomi returned, or the author, Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So here we have this, this summary. Naomi had returned to Bethlehem from Moab with her daughter-in-law, Ruth the Moabite. And he adds here that they came, you see, at the beginning of the barley harvest, which was in late April or early May. So we have a little chronological note here. The wheat harvest would follow in about two weeks. But this chronological note, you see, it sets the stage for what's going to happen in chapter 2. So here they wind up coming back, and what do you know? They're back at the beginning of the barley harvest. And then we see in two one it says, Now Naomi had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now the author mentions that Naomi, oh by the way, Naomi has a relative on her husband's side, this fellow named Boaz. Now the mention of somebody from the clan of Elimelech, when the writer mentions somebody from the clan of Elimelech, the ears of those familiar with ancient Israelite family law and custom, whoop, they perk up. All right, here we're writing this story. We say, now, now, by the way, she had a relative, a worthy of the clan of Elimelech. So those who are tuned in to Israelite family law and custom, they're going to be going, oh, what's this about? How, where is this going to go? See, we're told that Boaz, it says he's a mighty man, is what it really says. The ESV says a worthy man. But it says he's a mighty man, and it's ambiguous about mighty in what? In power? In wealth? In status? Okay, but whatever that ambiguity, it's clear that he's no average Joe. Okay, this guy is somebody of means, somebody of status. And so worthy man is fine with me. But he's somebody who's got some means and got some status within the society there. And he's said to be from the clan of Elimelech, and that fact is so significant that it's going to be repeated in just two verses, in chapter 2, verse 3. Now, as I mentioned, and as you already knew, clans, they are subdivisions of tribes consisting of groups of extended families that had descended from a common ancestor. Okay, so we have the 12 tribes, and then within those tribes you have clans. So these clans are subsets of the tribes. They're groups of extended families that descended from a common ancestor. And Boaz and Elimelech, they're both Ephrathites. They're both Ephrathites, okay, a subset of the tribe of Judah, the same as King David. 1 Samuel 17, 12. 
Now the land the Israelites conquered, it was allotted to the twelve tribes, but it was allotted to the twelve tribes according to their clans. You see that in Joshua 13 to 19, meaning that, as Hubbard says, clans enjoyed inalienable ownership of specific lands. So by tribes, but within the tribes, the land was given according to clans. Ownership of land, it had to remain with the clan to which it had been given. The clan had to maintain ownership of that, and that was a state that the kinsman redeemer was obliged to protect. That was part of his function was that if somebody had to, had to get rid of some property or sell it because of poverty, he had to bring that back into the ownership of the clan. That was his family duty and responsibility. So you see these things popping up. Hubbard remarks, he says, inclusion of an individual's clan in his name served as a geographical address. No one outside the clan, not even other Israelites, could own land within that territory. So clans are a very significant social group within ancient Israel. Now, I want to read chapter 2, verses 2 to 17 is really the section. But rather than read the entire section and then go back and deal with it piecemeal, I'm just going to read it in pieces. Okay, we'll read in chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. It says, And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. And he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Now Ruth here, she politely asked Naomi for permission to go out and to gather from the fields that were being harvested, ears of grain that either were dropped or left standing by the reapers. And Naomi tells her, yeah, okay, uh, you know, this is just a matter of submission to the, to the mother-in-law. She says, you know, can I go out and do that? She says, go ahead and go do it. Now, this practice known as gleaning, this practice known as gleaning, this was a right guaranteed under the Mosaic Law. You can see it in Leviticus 19, 9, and 10. Leviticus 23, uh, verse 20, chapter 23, verse 22, Deuteronomy 24, 19 and 22. So you had, this was a right that people had under the Mosaic Law, where landowners, they were required to leave an edge around their field unharvested. And they were also prohibited from going back through the field to pick up stalks they'd missed or dropped during the initial harvest. So you had to leave this little edge around the field, and also, once you harvested, you couldn't go back and double up and say, oh, you got to go back and pick up whatever I dropped. Or, oh, you, you, you missed that little spot over there, go pick that up. You weren't allowed to do that. And you weren't allowed to do that. It was to be left for the poor and the resident aliens. So they could then go and pick up, you know, scavenge, basically, is what it is. They could pick up the scraps and what was left and what had fallen. So this is something that was required under the Mosaic Law, and though it was a right under the law, Naomi, uh, Ruth says, see, Naomi, no, Ruth, Ruth, Ruth intended to ask permission to glean. You see, that's what it says here when it says, and Ruth the Moabite said, let me go in the field and glean among the years of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. So she's going to go and she's going to ask permission to do it either from the landowner or the on-site reapers. See, the landowner, he's going to, he has people out there doing that. So she's, even though there's a right to it, she is going to go and seek permission. She's going to go out there, and her gleaning, you see, it would depend on the favor or mercy of someone. You see, that's confirmed as we'll get down in chapter 2, verse 7. So you think, well, what's going on here? Well, what it suggests is that landowners, either the landowner or the reapers who are on site, that they occasionally, if not frequently, they disallow gleaning. Ah, oh, that couldn't be. The Mosaic Law says you have to, yeah, come on. You see that? They, yeah, they occasionally, they, they, if not frequently, they disallowed gleaning. Why would they want to do that? Because they wanted to keep their stuff. <laughs> they wanted to keep their stuff. So they occasionally would disallow it, whether they did it by ridicule, whether they did it by tricks. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you go ahead over here. Or whether they did it by just outright forbidding the person. It seems clear that some favor or mercy was needed so she says i'm going to go out and i'm going to request that i be permitted to glean in somebody's field 
And the repeating here, when it repeats, it says, and Ruth the Moabite in 2.2, the repeating of her identification as a Moabite after she's just been identified that way, in chapter 1, verse 22, that may be intended to highlight that her gleaning would be particularly dangerous. You say, why? Well, because she's an unattached woman who's out here by herself and she's a foreigner and a Moabite. So you could see people that, you know, I mean, they're just going to mess with her. And so that may be why that's repeated. just reminds you that, hey, she's in a perilous situation. She's going to go out and glean, but she has to be mighty careful about it. You see, she would be at greater risk of being abused in the fields, whether verbally, physically, you know, people mocking her, messing with her, or even assaulting her. So that might be what's there. Now, chapter 2, at ver- verse 3 here, this opens where it says, So she set out and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. This is a summary statement. Okay, the details of this are unfolded in the second part of the verse. In other words, verse 3 here, it's not a chronological sequence, all right, where you say, so she went out and gleaned in the field after the reapers, then after she did that, then she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. That's not what's intended. What is intended is that her doing this first part here, so she set out, went, she set out and went and gleaned in the fields after the reapers, that happens in her going through the field of Boaz. Okay, it is a concomitant circumstance, as noted by Bush and Hubbard. You see, that it was in the events in Boaz's field, that's where she gleaned behind the reapers. Now, to me, that's significant, because as I'm reading this, I'm trying to say, well, wait a minute, what's happening here? Okay, so you just get this summary statement, the details of which, when did she do that? How did she do that? It happens in the field belonging to Boaz. That's how this came about. So she goes out to glean, and shazam, she winds up. It says, it just so happened, right? It just so happened she winds up in the field belonging to Boaz. Now, it's helpful to note that the fields, these fields, they're outside of town. And they are large, unmarked tracks that have different owners. So you can have, so, you know, it's not like here's this fenced-in, walled-in little plot. You just have this big field and, yeah, Boaz, he owns here. So-and-so owns here, he owns here, then Boaz owns here, somebody else, and Boaz owns over here. This is how these things were done. Here's what Hubbard says. One individual might own several such pieces which need not be adjacent. To take advantage of all available land, no visible fences or boundaries were used. Rather, each field was identified by the name of its owner. You see, so, so it's important here to see, you know, inside knowledge was useful. Somebody knew where this land was. Somebody knew that this little piece right here belonged to Boaz, but you couldn't see it, obviously. So it would help, and you needed some kind of inside knowledge. Now, this opening of chapter 2, verse 3, where it says, as I commented in reading, it says, So she set out and went and gleaned in the fields after the reapers, and she happened, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. Here it is, field, this field out here. She's out here wandering around, and what do you know? She winds up right in the part of the field that belongs to Boaz. You see, and so this, sometimes it's translated here, she happened, or as it turned out, she found herself, and the point is that Ruth ends up in Boaz's portion of the fields without any intent on her part to do so. In other words, she's not navigating toward Boaz's area because she doesn't even know Boaz exists. Okay, so she happens from her perspective. There's no intent on her part to do that. She had no idea who he was. But having just mentioned, you see, that Boaz was from the clan of Elimelech, what's the reader to understand? The reader is to understand that what was happenstance from Ruth's perspective was in fact the hand of God. You think she just happened to Boaz's field? (laughs) Now, do you see? Do you see how God is working here? No great explosion. No, uh, you know, what's he doing? From her perspective, it's happenstance. But God is orchestrating this as sure as I'm standing here. See, as sure as I'm standing here, He led her to that part of the field. And to me, you see, this is something about life and providence. And you see here that God has led her there. Daniel Block, he calls this one of the key statements in the book. Here's what Block says. 
He says, the statement is ironical. Its purpose is to undermine purely rational explanations for human experiences and to refine the reader's understanding of providence. In reality, he's screaming, see the hand of God at work here? And of course he is. He says, by the way, uh, there was a relative of Elimelech's. Can I go out and glean? Oh yeah. Just happened to wind up there. Come on! You see, he says, in reality, he's screaming, see the hand of God at work here. The same hand that had sent the famine and later provided food is the hand that had brought Naomi and Ruth to Bethlehem precisely at the beginning of the harvest, 122, and has now guided Ruth to that portion of the field belonging specifically to Boaz. And in the same vein, it says, and behold, my word is Shazam. Right? Oh, it and behold, and behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem. Well, that's, that's very convenient, isn't it? That here he is coming from the city right when she happened to stumble into his portion of the field that's not marked. She happens to be there and he happens to come from Bethlehem right at that moment. And he arrives in that field from the town. Presumably he's there to inspect the progress of the harvest. And by the way, you can see something of the kind of man that he is by the greeting here. He says to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answer back to him, the Lord bless you. You don't get this sense of, you know, you see that you see him as a good man. He's a people who has people working for him. They're not sitting there saying, this guy's worthless, you know. I won't, no, no, no. Why? He, he's a generous, kind, fair, you see, person. Somebody who understands. How would God have you treat people? And then we go to verses 5 to 9. I heard that first bell. He says, then Boaz said to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? And the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. You see, she was asking permission. So she came and she's continued from the early morning until now except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they're reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. So here we see, you know, Ruth, she not only happens to be in this unmarked field that belongs to Boaz, she doesn't know about Boaz. He happens to appear. Behold, he shows up at the time. And he happens, she happens to be where he sees her. Okay, so she happens to be where he sees her and he inquires about her identity, asking about the family to which she belongs, either as a member or as a servant. He wants to know, who is this strange person I don't recognize there? What's her connection? Who does she belong to? Is she some family member I don't know? Or is she a servant of somebody that I don't know? Who is this person here? And the servant in charge of the reapers informs Boaz that she's the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from Moab. And he adds that, look, she requested permission to glean and she'd been hard at it since early morning. So she'd come and ask, can I go ahead and, and pick the droppings? And they'd said, yeah, you can do that. And she's been working diligently. Now, it's very unlikely, I think this will be all, it's very unlikely that I'll be able to say anything else before that bell rings. So, uh, Lord willing, we'll start next week. Thank you.